this financial year 2021-22 the number of women mscs who have benefited that has grown seven times so 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 it's kind of increasing as women many times we feel that whether we can speak or not and so speaking and let people know what we need is very important having conversations around the need for creating a differential environment for women is not felt but what is important to understand is that when a project a technology project is being done how are you bringing in the perspective uh, of women in that particular project be it technology or be it you know the objective of the business uh, it's important for all of us to understand what it would take to make sure that the diverse workforce that we have we create equal opportunities for them good afternoon everyone thank you so much for inviting me for this uh, session and moderating on uh, women in technology very interesting topic though and uh, i have uh, with me mrs annie matthew amrita gangotra and mohita sajwan so um, we all are aware that a uh, lot of women are there we have a chairperson a session chair has arrived ishita ganguly tripathi who is additional development commissioner ministry of msme government of india now ma'am prasad uh, extremely sorry for the delay i was waiting at the gate for 15 minutes i didn't know which way to go and of course there was connectivity issue is what i'm told so could not connect to any of you so uh, good afternoon everyone it's really my privilege pleasure to be here and i had a lot to say maybe i could just catch up my breath and you could uh, go ahead with the session sure ma'am uh so uh just taking forward this conversation uh we have the women leaders with us and i would like to start with a very small uh, common questions where i would like to have view on on uh, do you think the technology projects are now envisaged keeping women in mind you can start <laughs> now you can thank you yeah so um I I don't really think that projects are being created with women in mind as such uh you know the projects are projects as such but what is important to understand is that when a project a technology project is being done how are you bringing in the perspective uh of women in that particular project be it technology or be it you know the objective of the business because when do you have gender parity in a particular project the way that goes uh the empathy the eq or the balancing of perspective that is quite different from uh, a project which is uh, i would say all women or or men uh, really so having a balance uh, of people in a technology project that is delivering to the business objective is the most important thing um uh, women are not necessarily uh, i mean projects are not necessarily being created only for women but also the second point i would like to say is that technology is helping women and entrepreneurs or women in in the uh, rural areas etc uh, through the use of let's say mobile um to become entrepreneurs the fact that you can do a mobile wallet the fact that you can do banking on uh, a mobile uh, when there is connectivity it does make women more independent in the rural space uh, and things like that so those are two perspectives that i would like to uh, you know bring about uh, good good afternoon everyone i hope i am audible normally yeah. i don't need the mic i should be audible without that also but yeah uh so i think international month for women is what we are celebrating this month and it's good to be able to once again talk about how women in technology make a difference and how do we empower more women in technology uh, so coming to whether technology projects get designed around or created for women 
uh, i don't think so uh, i think uh, project technology deployment doesn't depend on gender is not gender sensitive from a deployment perspective from a usability from designing the uh, app for uh, software for uh, ease of use uh, and bringing in different perspectives to the ease of use their gender could be a factor but i don't think from a technology deployment perspective the only place where i would still confess to a bias would be if i have the opportunity between a, a man and a woman of possibly equal standing if i have to choose who should lead a project possibly i would select a woman as compared to a man and the only reason for that is i find that women tend to be much more focused and i attribute that to the fact that they are balancing so many things juggling so many things that the amount of work time that they spent at work they tend to be very focused on work and on meeting the objectives and deliverables and uh, uh, there isn't any degree of frivolousness at work uh, they they're very committed and passionate about what they do so to that extent i would admit to a bias but otherwise not moita yeah thanks for the question uh, can you hear me okay i think so thanks for the question and then firstly good afternoon to everybody really glad to be sharing the stage with uh, all the esteemed panelists here i think it's a very important topic to bring outside the boardroom into forums like this where we can discuss how do we give women an equal opportunity at work uh, it's important for all of us to understand what it would take to make sure that the diverse workforce that we have we create equal opportunities for them in terms of leadership development career opportunities and then make sure that we have a lot more diverse set of leaders in our organizations but coming to the point that you were making um i really don't think that i would personally want anybody to design a project or technology project to um you know make adjustments for women the fact is any technology pro program or project is done with the intent of meeting an objective for an organization and therefore you need to pick the right talent for that project the broader question for me uh, would be do we today have an equal number of women picking science technology uh, engineering and math as a work stream uh, do we have an equal percentage of young girls learning to code right from their school age uh, onwards and therefore do we have that kind of parity in terms of skill sets uh, between women and men and work are we promoting enough women uh, in the technology space to give them an equal seat at the table and not promote them because they are women but promote them because they bring the right talent but then do that without a bias okay thank you, thank you. Uh, so we are talking about being more uh, women are very focused and uh, should not be very specific to projects and uh, inclusiveness so uh, any i would like to pose a question to you that what companies should do to build spaces uh, that support growth for women especially in manufacturing domain thank you thank you lily for that yeah uh yeah uh, that, that's a very specific problem i come from a manufacturing background uh, most of my I mean while the, i did have a stint in uh, it service also most of my career is in manufacturing industries and uh, i think when i started off it was oh we gave you a women's toilet be thankful for that the conversation has started from that Uh, and i think what the manufacturing industry still does is thinks that it has done enough by just providing a ladies toilet having conversations around the need for creating a differential environment for women is not felt uh, most manufacturing companies tend to be very productivity focused very uh, clock focused there are shifts which operate uh, very time focused what have you uh, produced within a certain shift what have you achieved so all the metrics are very shift and time focused as opposed to it uh, organizations which tend to be more deliverables focused right so you have something quantifiable which you are able to deliver at the end of a, a day or 
or a uh, you can have a project uh, timeline defined and you deliver the project within that timeline your contribution to it unlike that in a manufacturing ecosystem which is more driven by the clock changing conversation to diversity and inclusiveness is very very difficult i have been struggling with that just the thought of work from home till the pandemic was unbelievable i mean nobody could even conceive of that that you can actually run things from home while the things have changed what typically happens is there is i mean if i look at the numbers diversity numbers so i am actually not entitled to sit here at all we typically have i think 4% uh are the kind of numbers we have uh, I, but i see the struggle of how to bring more women in because we have not changed ourselves to be more inclusive for women it is very difficult to bring more women in and that becomes a vicious cycle so first of all acknowledging that there needs to be a different treatment given to women at least initially so what happened is i think most of us who are senior uh, would say we believed in an ecosystem where we were given equal opportunity we did not expect any concessions as such we said you just give us the opportunity we will do whatever it takes don't treat us differently nowadays i see that the conversation has changed the millennials expect to be treated differently they say we may be similar but we are not identical please acknowledge the differences and treat us accordingly that conversation is simply impossible in a manufacturing organization uh, where the representation is so low so to me more conversations designed around how to bring in more women a conscious effort a change in the recruitment strategy uh more uh, flexible hours work from home uh, opportunities all of these together need to be put in place to make a woman feel recognized the second part is the counter resentment like even last few months we were essential services and we were working throughout uh we uh, gave women with children small children and all exemption that uh, to manage the risk please sit at home the amount of resentment which it created among the male colleagues was unbelievable uh, so sensitizing male colleagues that what does it take for a woman to come to office how does she manage the different environments just because you made a lifestyle choice that your wife will not work does not mean that you do not accommodate other women at work some of these are conversations which we should not shy away from that is what i feel much uh, so uh, we've noted your point where you need to have a differential environment but more so i would like to say that when we talk of manufacturing industry we were always told that it is a very difficult place to work aap nahi ja payenge ma'am so so that's how the uh, impression of manufacturing industry has been so leading our conversation to uh, amrita we just like to know it's a very simple question do you feel you had to work harder than uh, male colleagues to advance your career you know uh, i'm not sure i would say yes because i've had very supportive bosses and companies which were very very um, conscious about creating uh, diversity and inclusiveness whether you talk about companies like nestle where i worked for when my daughter was born and the fact that was one company that gave 4 months of maternity leave during the time when it was only mandatory and statutory to give 3 months uh, was a starting point uh, i've also worked in companies like bharti airtel in india and vodafone in europe where the topic of diversity and inclusion and creating parity for women is always top on the agenda so i've just been fortunate as i would say as compared to like what any was saying in terms of the challenges in manufacturing i've also worked in a manufacturing company hcl where i did see some factors of saying oh you can't be on the shop floor or you cannot work 24 by 7 what i did face uh, not so much the fact that i have to work harder but sometimes uh, you know the restraint that i would have 
um, in terms of uh, ability to do things uh, in a physical manner. I'll tell you one um, aspect, like for example, I've been in a telecom company for over 20, 22 uh, years. Now in a telecom company, health and safety is extremely important aspect that we monitor, especially when you're building towers uh, and when you're laying down fiber, uh, the health and safety of the workers is extremely important. As a leader, as a CTIO, I would need to visit the various field uh, sites, climb towers, uh, you know, just to ensure that the aspects that have to be taken care as far as health and safety is concerned uh, are being met. And I'm seen there in the front. So at times, sometimes those limitations when you're climbing, uh, you know, towers or going up off the, uh, you know, the uh, high on the rooftop, etc., does become a limitation, but it's not, uh, and therefore, I don't know if you want to call it working harder, physically maybe, but not necessarily, you know, um, uh, the fact that I worked in companies that have uh, really been inclusive. So I wouldn't generalize to say that companies are not sensitive or companies are not aware that diversity and inclusion is important, but creating more awareness and more, um, you know, structured program around this is going to be extremely important. Thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, for being so lucky to have an inclusive policy in place. I understand yes. that uh, telecom companies are quite, uh, you know, very sensitive to women uh, because of the uh, nature of the work that they are uh, taking. So uh, now taking back to uh, Mohita, just uh, we wanted to know from you that uh, uh, do you think the work that is given to women nowadays are stereotyped and do you feel the importance of having a diversity in the nature of work? I, I mean, I absolutely believe in the diversity that we need to have at work. Um, Moita, I think your mic is not clear. You cl Take Are it you closer. Know. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. I was just saying that it's absolutely important to have the diversity at work. Uh, the fact is women are 50% of the world's population and hence you can't leave 50% of smart people out, out of your technology projects or when you're trying to solve um, you know, important or tough challenges in the world. So women do need to participate in that uh, as we are making progress uh, across the globe. Um, stereotypes do seep into, um, okay, look, the thing is that all of us are human beings. Human beings have biases. Uh, some biases are good to have. We have a cognitive bias. We tend to think about things in a certain way. Whether you're a man or a woman, you have a confirmation bias. You want to be with people who look like you, who've come from schools like yours. And the problem is when these biases begin to, uh, you know, begin to the point where your decision making is putting, is becoming stereotypical in saying this person should not be doing this kind of a job or this person should not be doing this just because it's a stereotype and a bias that you are carrying that cannot be good for the organization. Um, therefore, for every organization, and I, I'm, I'm part of GenPact, and at GenPact we have a very strong uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion program. And I believe it's very important for every company uh, today to have that kind of a program, which <laughs> begins by making sure that diversity and inclusion becomes a core business imperative, so much so that your diversity, equity, and inclusion program should be very closely uh, intertwined with your company's purpose. GenPact, which is the organization I work for, our purpose is the relentless pursuit of a world that works uh, better for people, not just 50% of the people, the entire population. So it's very important that you don't just, as an organization, say that diversity and inclusion is important, you must make sure that it is very closely intertwined and uh, you know intertwined with your company's purpose this has to then be supported by some key pillars you've got to make sure that you have uh, policies and systems in place to support women uh, it, it is you know uh, unfortunately uh, only women can you know take the generation forward 
So they don't, they have to take a break from work. Men don't need to take that break from work to take care of their child or take care of their families. And hence, in Genpak, for example, we have a program which is called a Working Mothers Program or a Career 2.0, which welcomes women who've had to fall out of the workforce for one reason or the other. So we welcome them back. We make sure we give them the right opportunity at the right place when they, when they come back and the opportunity can work around their schedule. As a young mother, you can't be working a late night shift or as a young mother, you can't be working extended hours. So we make sure that we give these women that, that kind of an opportunity. Uh, the second pillar on which you have to stand up a diversity and inclusion program is to make sure that you're creating a network and you are taking this program across all the functions and all the uh, you know uh, parts of the organization. And hence we've built some very strong networking programs in the company. There is a leadership development program for women as well. All these, these things have to be in place to make sure that, you know, and finally, uh, use of technology, use of technology to break bias. Uh, we do a number of seminars, webinars. Uh, there is a training, an annual training that every employee has to go through uh, to understand how unconscious bias at, comes, uh, at work comes into play and how that impacts decision making. Uh, when you will take a decision based on a bias and not based on looking at the talent in the right manner. So, uh, sorry for that long answer, believe very passionately in the subject. I do think that uh, organizations must create these kind of programs and, and, and you know, uh, Genpact has been recognized as uh, the number one uh, organization for women to work for in the US in 21 uh, by Forbes. In India, we've been recognized twice over in the previous two years and I'm very proud to be part of this organization. I do wish that more organizations can build uh, programs like these and encourage, like I said, 50% of the smart people on this world to participate in problem solving. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Moita. Uh, very, uh, you've listed the points very well, where you are talking about how uh, diversity is important, how uh, relentless pursuit to work is important, and then uh, the point that you talked about purpose of the organization to be intertwined with the uh, uh, women by keeping women in mind that is very important and I feel that nowadays people are talking about having an inclusive policy so with this uh, we talk to Amrita now how do you see the growth of women as leading technologists in your organization you being the leader how do you? Sorry, I... Yeah, I said, how do you see growth of women growth as women. leading technologists in your organization? Well, uh, I have found that, uh, you know, it's been very difficult to actually hire uh, women oh, in, in technology as such. Uh, and not too many CVs I get, especially at the senior level when I'm trying to hire women in technology. Now, I kept wondering uh, why this is so. And the interesting thing is whether in India or when I was in Europe, I have been very interested to understand why is it that you will find more women in maybe HR or maybe, uh, you know, even marketing, uh, uh, but finding women in technology, uh, especially at the leadership level, is uh, very hard. Now, if on the other side, if you look, look at the statistics, especially in India, uh, about 43% women uh, in schools and in colleges, undergraduate, take up STEM subjects, which is science, technology, engineering, and maths, right? So, which means uh, there is a possibility and people, when they are children, etc., the parents are encouraging uh, girls to take up the STEM uh, which is really not true in Europe. To my very surprise, I found in the UK and in even um, Europe where I was in Hungary, uh, the percentage of girls taking up STEM after they leave school is in the 20s and 30%, which is much lower than in India. So that was a big positive for us over here. But as uh, women enter the workforce, it's very, very leaky. More so even here in research and universities, you do not find 
more than single digit or lower double digit percentage of women in the leadership roles in enterprises in technology or even in the research field. And my um, experience says, because I have been very closely watching all of this area and I have been very passionate on trying to recruit women in technology. Uh, yes, technology is predominantly, especially if you're in operations, uh, IT operations or technology operations, it's a 24 by seven job. It does become difficult to juggle uh, the various roles that we have to play unless you've got supportive family and supportive husband, it does become a very strenuous thing. So I have seen uh, girls do not progress beyond mid um, level or get higher. We sometimes have to take break and when you take break uh, in technology, you become outdated very, very fast. Unfortunately, that's one of the things I say that in our field, in technology, if you are not up to date, the younger generation will know more than uh, you know. Whether you're a doctor or whether you are uh, a, a, you know, a lawyer, the more experience you get, uh, you know, you, um, the more number of years you work, the more experience you get, you are more knowledgeable. Whereas in IT or in technology or in STEM, uh, that's not true. You have to keep yourself updated. You have to know uh, yourself and be an expert in the domain that you work in. And it's vast. Technology is really, really vast. So I think it has been very difficult for women in uh, to keep up when they have so many roles that they have to play when they're in the mid-management at home, outside, otherwise also. So that is one of the reasons why it's been leaky. Organizations, when they are doing the diversity and inclusion programs, as Mohita was talking about, there needs to be special focus on uh, how you can encourage women to come back to work. In technology, that also would mean that you facilitate uh, reskilling uh, their uh, experience and uh, the letting them go through self-learning and new courses. Uh, because, you know, if you take a break of five years in technology, there are new technologies that will come in. You have to do certification, etc. So that's my hypothesis that, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult. I've been very passionate of trying to get in women in technology. But that is something that we, if we are uh, keeping focus at the management level, uh, it needs to have these type of conscious structured programs to enable that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amrita. And I feel that now, uh, not only IT, I think every domain that we talk about, whether it is hospitality or it is health or it is IT, every domain is now changing so fast Correct. that we That's need true. to keep ourselves upgraded. And because I think women are so, uh, I mean, in, included in so many types of different work that sometimes we do miss out the chords. But when we talk of inclusiveness and when we talk of going hand in hand, then we need to keep ourselves upgraded and back in uh, shoes. So, uh, any, uh, so coming back to technology now, we've been talking about women and technology. Just wanted to know any new innovation or technology initiative you've taken in your organization. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, I think we have to be uh, on the quest for innovation all the time. Uh, I don't think that ever stops because the fastest way to die is to not change. Yeah. And uh, anything, whatever the technologies we talk of today, uh, whether it is RPA, whether it is uh, video analytics, whether it is uh, uh, analytics as such, we are doing enough initiatives out there um, to address business problems. Technology for the sake of technology doesn't make sense, though we also dabble with that. But primarily technology to say or solve business problems. And we find that there are a lot of use cases using video analytics or image analytics. So that's something which we have been leveraging quite well. Uh, normally when you look at uh, manufacturing kind of industries, as I mentioned, productivity is a big ask. And uh, one way to improve productivity is to look at the manpower numbers and see how to optimize what work is being done by manpower. In video analytics, image analytics kind of solutions have been helping us increase productivity quite significantly.
Uh, if I can just uh, yeah. uh, add to that, I don't think the mic is working. If I, I just want to add to yeah. uh, what Annie just said. From a services organization perspective, I think one of the things which is becoming extremely important is uh, user experience and employee experience. Because uh, honestly, I think Apple and iPhone uh, and Samsung phones, they've all spoiled us. You need easy interfaces. You're talking about uh, hiring millennials at work. They don't want to come and work on clunky systems. So as you're thinking about technology innovation at work, uh, user experience has been one of the key vectors that we've been focusing on, whether it is moving things to the cloud or uh, you know, implementing better systems. We just part announced a partnership with Workday for their uh, HCM and their finance uh, uh, you know, systems because they are easier. So I think the point is for the younger generation, user experience at work uh, is extremely important and therefore technology innovation has to keep that in mind as well. Yeah, so would you like to talk about a little on technology where we are thinking of now AI, ML, uh, blockchain has become a word of mouth everywhere. So uh, are you going to use or do you uh, think that you will be using it in your organization to cope up? Yeah, we are actually we are extensively uh, using all these technologies as we are working with different customers. Um, in, so we work with several clients, uh, Fortune 500 companies, where we help them build right, the right solutions for solving their business problems, whether it is using AI, machine learning, or simple automation using robotics. It is a core and a key skill that you need to build uh, as part of any organization, especially a services and transformation services organization that Genpack is. So yes, there's a lot of focus. Uh, we leverage our platform, knowledge platform called Genome to help uh, build these skills and the knowledge and understanding of these skills in our broader operating teams. That coupled with people or technologists who actually bring the capability that allows you to use these technologies in the right manner because there is no point in using AI and machine learning for the heck of using AI and machine learning it has to be used in the context of the problem that you're trying to solve. So that's the view that we take, but yes, it's a capability that we have to nurture and we have to build. Yeah, because it is still in the niche stage and people are now trying to innovate how to use it more effectively. And so coming back, I got a lot of views from you. I just wanted to know from each one of you a small message for the women entrepreneurs, leaders, and uh, those uh, women who are striving to come back to the mainstream, that what is your uh, message that you want to give to women technologists to become leader and uh, create their own space? You can start. Uh, I think uh, my advice to every woman is going to be that first know your why. Know why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, because that's important. Please just don't fritter around and you know spend time doing it. And if you want to do that, that's fine. Know your why. Make sure that you have um, you know a board of directors, if you will, which is a set of coaches, mentors uh, in the organization or outside the organization who can be your go-to people to help you uh, you know deal with new situations at work. Um, uh, I think the other advice that I have for young women is. <clears throat> Um, you know, it, there was a question earlier that was asked that do women have to work harder than men? I don't think women have to work harder than men, but um, women don't feel that confident about what they have done and hence, does that give them a seat at the table? And knowing that yes, I have a seat at the table, that is something that women need to be more conscious about. So my advice to young women is keep working hard and keep, keep asking for that chair at the table and grab it. Uh, okay. uh, I think uh, one of the mistakes which most women make is they make their career their personal journey. I don't think it should ever be only their personal journey. They need to enroll entire family and ecosystem to be part of that journey. You can't do it alone. You need support. If your family is not with you, if your ecosystem is not with you on this, you are, I mean, you will find it that much more harder to 
succeed so that is one thing which i would do second is speak up i find that most women while they deliver uh, good uh, work and all and they are very good at what they do they don't speak up and ask for what they want in return if they want to step up to a role or if they assume that somebody is looking out for them and it will automatically get done i always ask my team members if you want something if you see an opportunity come up to me speak ask for it i don't know i i may not always have your interest in mind or i may not always be thinking about you so please come up and speak that's the first and most important thing i would say thank you yeah. so um you know i would uh, really ask these questions in in a little bit of compartments i would say first are organizations trying to do that the things which are necessary for women to come back to work or to continue to work or to be in fields like technology i would say there is uh, more and more awareness especially multinationals and big companies are starting to do a lot there is a lot of awareness that is happening so that's one side of the story the second is about the self the self motivation the self uh, you know need for being financially independent or having a full fledged career is up to oneself so i have seen women not always having that ambition or that fire in the belly to make a career or be at it uh, and maybe there are other reasons because it happens but one has to have the tenacity the determination and the passion to make a success out of a full fledged career for that everything will not be given on a plate you know whether you're a man or a woman you have to work at your career you have to know how to network you have to be up to speed with the domain in your working you're working in you have to be able to have an awareness that will uh, you know that will guide you through to know how your career will go so that's the self part of it and second and the last part that i would say is uh, asking for help from people around you and your family your uh, you know colleagues your bosses don't shy away from, from that we tend to keep quiet we suffer in silence uh, we take on a lot of more responsibility than um, you know there are people willing to support you willing to uh, cheer for you in your career just reach out so that is how i would like to end thank you so much so uh, the end i would like to just summarize that uh, very important that you said that you know your why have the confidence to lead and i am sure whenever you are given an opportunity and you take it in your stride you are going to be very successful passion has to be passion and fire to be successful has to be kept live uh, we as women many times we feel that whether we can speak or not and so speaking and let people know what we need is very important and it is not important only for women but any team member for that matter has to be their self motivation self motivation motivation and to be financially independent is an, a very important need of the day to have an identity at least for a woman and then the fire and passion to be kept alive thank you all so much and then i i'll like to hand over the mic to ma'am and just like to know what are the policies and standards in place for women uh, nowadays and you can express your views thank you so much thank you uh, am i audible yes sir okay uh, thank you uh, thanks to the organizers for thinking of such a topical theme and i must uh, congratulate all my co-panelists for putting across their views so lucidly i thoroughly enjoyed this session and my co-panelists have such a varied and rich experience in diverse uh, fields so i have definitely gained from this um what i i wanted to talk about uh, was from the government perspective just wanted to quote data from three of our portals 
One is the Champions Portal and my senior colleague Ati sir is right here who's uh, behind the Champions Portal. Um, so uh, from there we see that uh, it, this portal was launched amidst the uh, first wave of the pandemic. And there we see that uh, more than uh, 44,000 uh, grievances have been received. And a significant part of those grievances are related to credit issues and some to technology as well. So uh, we do have schemes and uh, in the recent past, just the la just past few months, we've had some revamping of schemes and some new schemes have been uh, launched where we are looking at these uh, aspects of uh, credit related issues, technology in particular. So that was about the Champions Portal. About Udyam Portal, I wanted to mention that in this was launched on the 1st of July 2020 and since then we've had 79 lakh registrations already of micro, small and medium enterprises. One of my colleagues, uh, my, one of my co-panelists mentioned here about the number of uh, women in the total population. So if you look at the registrations on the Udyam portal, it's definitely skewed. 17% of micro, small and medium enterprises are owned by women. Uh, here I would like to mention about the role of awareness. When we uh, had a special drive for uh, women entrepreneurs to be registered on the, on the Udyam portal, we found that since the 1st of March till yesterday, we've already had almost about 90,000 women who have registered. So that kind of underscores the need for creating awareness. The third thing I wanted to mention is again about another portal of ours that's called the Samban portal where we have the figures for public procurement. Now we have a PPP, Public Procurement Policy Order of 2012, amended in 2018, which says that ministries and CPSCs necessarily have to procure 25% from micro and small enterprises. That 25% uh, mark, we've overshot it. Sometimes it's, uh, it's almost 32% as well. The part which is worrisome is that out of the 25%, 3% have to be uh, procured from, exactly, from women, uh, micro and small enterprises. We haven't yet reached the 3%. But the heartening fact is that between 2018-19 till this uh, and uh, this this financial year 2021-22 the number of women MSCs who have benefited that has grown seven times so so, so it's kind of increasing and the figure which was 0.15% in 1819 is now almost 1% so we are far away from the 3% but we are definitely uh, moving in the right direction um, these were some of the uh, these were the three uh, portals I wanted to talk about and the um, and the and the figures from there. Thank you so much, all my thank you to all my co-panelists and ma'am for uh, steering this conversation so so very well. And we have a very interesting session uh, where my senior colleague will be there. So a lot more to look forward to. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a thank lovely session. But before we close, I would like to request Mr. Sandeep Narula, Chairman ESC, to give our mementos to our esteemed speakers. We'll start with our chairperson, Ishita Ganguly Tripathi, Additional Development Commissioner, Ministry of MSME. Our moderator, Dilip Prasad. Chief Technology Officer, Food Safety and Standards Authority of India. Our speakers, Annie Matthews, Chief Information Officer, Mother Dairy Fruit and Vegetables. Annie Matthews. Amrita Gangotra, MD, Ayukt.
digital solution. And Mohita Sajwan, Senior VP and Chief Operating Officer, Insurance Genpact. Mr. Narula, Mr. Narula, would you like to say a few words? A group photo. Would you like to say?